Hello everyone, hope you're doing okay, I hope you're keeping safe and I hope you're keeping sane. I'm just going to start this video with a couple of apologies. Firstly, if I sound and look awful, it's because I'm a little bit under the weather and nothing too serious, just a bad throat, bad head, bad eyes, bad everything really, but uh, yeah, not too bad, hanging in there. Um, secondly, obviously, um, I've not been made any videos for a while, um, I've actually been just super busy to be completely honest, been uh, really busy with work and stuff and uh, also haven't had a huge amount to talk about, although... You guys have still been supporting the channel. You've still been leaving your questions for the next Q&A, which I will get up um, and get sorted in the not too distant future. So with that said, I want to talk about um, effectively triggers today. Um, now, I think what I want to do to start with is sort of define what I mean by a trigger and how it differentiates from an urge. Uh, when we have um, an addiction or any kind of um, negative sort of pattern of behaviour. Um, we experience urges. I, to this day, still experience urges, although, as I've said many times before, they have lessened over the sort of last few years. Um, but urges are something that are, for most of us, always there, and that's not just with gambling. It's not always just with negative activities. You know, we have urges for all sorts of things, um, and sometimes they are stronger than others, and that can be affected by, you know, our situations, by the other factors around us, by the kind of mood we're in, the time of day, and all sorts of other things. So I'm not talking about urges as such. I want to talk about triggers, and triggers effectively are the detonator to make us act upon our urges like i say urges are always there but we don't always act on them i have urges for many things at many times but i don't always act on them um but triggers are that catalyst they are the detonator they are the thing that make us go and behave in a certain way do a certain thing you know eat certain food drink certain drinks you know have sex have you know take part in gambling whatever it is there are you know triggers that make us do that um and the one of the important things I've come to realise is actually identifying what those triggers are so that we can be prepared to you know, defend ourselves in the face of what will effectively become a, a, you know, an urge on the verge of ignition. Um, if you speak to a lot of people, they will say, well, the best way you can you know, placate um, a, a trigger, um, a better nullify, shall I say, a trigger is to avoid potential triggers. A lot of people I've spoken to have told me that um, alcohol, and I can certainly say this um, was the case for myself, you know, alcohol was a trigger to gambling. And that is for many reasons, some biological, some circumstantial. But the point is that if I had had a drink, then I would be more likely to gamble for whatever reason. Like I say, lowered um, inhibition, worse decision making, also just circumstantial, you know, because um, you're more likely to be, if you're drinking, you're more likely to be in a situation where gambling is far more accessible. So alcohol was a trigger. So people would say, well, that's okay, just avoid alcohol. And certainly in the early stages of recovery, in the short term, that was a reasonable idea for me. You know, if I avoided situations where I was likely to drink and where gambling would be available, then of course the likelihood that I would then give in to my urges and there would be a trigger would be massively reduced. However, it's fairly reasonable to say that for the vast majority of people, basically nullifying a significant part of your social life um, and the idea of going through the rest of your life without having, you know, being able to drink or whatever. Uh, you know, isn't very appealing and could in many ways actually make recovery from this addiction far more difficult because you feel like you are giving up much, much more than the gambling itself. So living, you know, without that trigger, yes, it might reduce your chance for gambling, but it's not an ideal situation. But it's also worth noting that there are substantial numbers of triggers of which we cannot, you know, void from our lives. A lot of people who develop addictions in the first place do so off the back of some traumatic event in their life. You know, when we have um, some great upheaval that really upsets the balance of our lives, that can lead us to seek solace in vices, and that includes obviously gambling, drinking, drugs, and all the other things. When we experience heartbreak, for example, separation from a partner, when we suffer bereavement, one of the most inevitable things we will have in our lives is that someone that we know, someone that is close to us, at some point in our lives will die. And bereavement is one of the largest triggers for negative and addictive behaviours. 
It's not something we can eliminate from our lives. We can't stop people from dying. So what we need to do is we need to learn to recognise that that is a trigger. And when we do suffer these traumatic events in our lives, we need to be better prepared to deal with the inevitable increase in urges and also, like I say, that detonator that is that trigger in the first place. Triggers are all around us. You could have a particularly bad day at work. And I know this from my own experience, both with gambling and with drinking. Now, I would use um, you know, a bad day at work as an excuse to take myself off to the bookies. Well, I've kind of earned it. Go on, it's my time to relax. I can use this as a... It's, I used what was effectively a trigger, you know, a flashpoint, as an excuse. Okay, But you can't avoid these flashpoints. You can't avoid these triggers. You will have bad days at work. You will have arguments with your partner. You will have bereavement in your life, tragically. But what we need to do is be prepared when these things happen to recognise it and go, right, normally at this point, I would deal with this situation by doing X, Y, Z, and X, Y, and Z would probably be negative behaviours. And whilst it is important to allow yourself to, um, you know, distance yourself sometimes from uh, terrible situations, you have to, you know, instinctively realise that the way you normally would do it is actually going to make your situation worse and that there must be another way to get around this. Common sense would say, and if you watch sort of self-help, self-improvement things here on YouTube or wherever, would say, okay, instead of acting at that flashpoint in a negative way with a harmful behaviour, go and do something productive, go and do something positive, that ultimately will come out, you know, you know, when you come out the other side of whatever the situation might be, you will be in a better position than when you started. People say instead of going to the pub and drinking excessively or going to the bookies and losing a load of money on the fob tees or whatever, okay, go to the gym, go and work out, you'll get an endorphin hit. You'll, and when you actually come out the other side of this negative part of your life, you will be in better shape physically, mentally and emotionally because of your actions. And yes, there's a lot of, lot of logic in that. Go and do something productive. Go to the gym. Go and do some voluntary work. Go for a run. Go do whatever. But, okay, and I've said this quite a long time ago, if you're someone who relies on an addictive crutch in times of hardship, in times of bereavement, in times of intense stress, then don't beat yourself up if the, your second place go-to is not something that is productive, valuable, great for great for community, great for your health, right? If you want to go and sit and play video games for hours, rather than go and gamble, rather than go and drink yourself into a stupor, you think, well, I'm just going to go sit and play video games for hours on end, okay? Don't beat yourself up for doing that. Yes, ultimately, it's not going to improve the world, it's not going to improve your mental or physical health in the long term. But whilst you're doing that, you're not doing the thing that you shouldn't be doing in response to these traumatic events. You are distancing yourself from doing further harm. You're not going to, like I say, you're not going to set the world alight, you're not going to improve yourself, but you're not doing yourself further harm. So, when the trauma subsides, when you do get outside, you know, through whatever difficult patch you're going through, when that trigger, when that ignition has died down, Okay, that normally ignite an urge to make you go and gamble or drink or whatever. Once that's died down, you're in no worse position than you were to start with. And if you are, it's only because you've been sat on your ass playing, I don't know, Fortnite or whatever for however long. I don't know, is Fortnite still a thing? Doesn't matter. Right. So that's the important thing to me. Urges are always there. They will subside in time. But triggers, we cannot truly avoid. If there is something very, very obvious that sets you off, for example, in my example, drinking correlating with gambling, then yes, in the early stages of recovery, it makes sense to you know, rid, those, rid your life of those triggers for at least the short term. But long term, we cannot avoid the bad things in life that lead us to addictive behaviours. So what we need to do is be prepared recognize these triggers, understand what they might be, and when they do happen, make sure that we act in a way that is not necessarily going to make our lives better, 
but is going to mean we can come through this, that traumatic experience, come out the other side in no worse a situation than we were before. I hope that makes sense. Thanks very much for all your support. Um, I'm going to put a little bit of a poll up on the channel. Um, very quickly, um, every time I log into my YouTube channel, uh, I say every time, it's been a couple of weeks now, isn't it? But um, they say, oh, you know, finish setting up your YouTube membership thing, right? And YouTube membership, for those who don't know, basically means you can be a member of the channel. And what that means is that you pay like a little subscription fee or something and you get added benefits, right? Now, a few people have said, you know, oh, Phil, you've really helped me out. You know, can I support the channel? Have you got a Patreon or whatever? I haven't got any of that sort of stuff set up at the moment, right? And so I thought, well, I could set it up. I could set up a YouTube membership thing. It, you know, it won't be a mandatory thing. If you want to support the channel or support me, shall I say, then you can do it. If you don't, then you don't. Just watch the videos and hopefully they, they help you, you know. Um, but YouTube insists that I provide something extra for these people signing up. You know, it's not just saying, you know, support me by clicking this button. It's saying, well, you need to offer something else to the people who sign up to your channel. And I am, uh, you know, in a quandary with that because I'm not going to do extra sort of, you know, gambling recovery kind of content for people who sign up and, you know, become a member of the channel because that's disingenuous. You know, if I think something, talking about something, giving my experiences or, you know, whatever is going to be helpful to people in a, a negative position with gambling then there's no way that I can say in clear conscience, well, no, you're not going to hear that information. You're not going to hear that advice or experience because you're not, you're not giving me four quid a month. You know, So I can't do that. Um, I can't promise anything in terms of uh, personal interaction because I don't have necessarily the time to do that. And again, if someone's in a really bad place and you know it's really struggling with gambling and there's another person, but because they're paying me four quid a month or whatever, you know, oh, well, no, I'll talk to you, but I won't talk to you that's horrible and completely against the initial purpose of this channel so i can't do that you know you can give people like silly little like, memes or little logos next to the names and stuff i could do that but what's the point you know i mean i could do what a lot of people do and have like a little patreon banner or something like um, a little patreon banner that sort of says all the people that support me i don't know like i say you know it's not the primary purpose of the channel um but Realistically, people have, have said they'd like to support me and support the channel. And also, shock, shock, shock horror, I'm, I'm human. You know, and if people do want to sort of send me a, a few quid a month, um, then I'm not going to say no. Because ultimately, you know, this, is, this does take up some of my time and my life. And um, whilst if I never earn a penny from it, I'd still do it. You know, no one's, no one's I don't think, going to sort of turn that sort of stuff down. So I'm going to put up a poll. Let me know in the comments as well if there's anything you think that you might benefit from that you might like to see but that wouldn't necessarily you know be then either harmful or not helpful for those people who don't subscribe because i don't care if you, you know if you want to support me brilliant you know really appreciate it if you don't and you just want to watch the videos and you get something from them that's great i don't you know i don't care but it is something i'm considering setting up so just let me know if you can th think of any ideas of things that maybe i could do that wouldn't be to the detriment of, of those people who don't don't sign up. Anyway, hope that makes sense. Keep safe, keep sane. Thanks very much for all your support, ongoing support, guys. Take it easy. Uh, have a good week, and I'll speak to you soon.